Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started tonight again. Thanks, guys, for taking time to come out and, and uh, spend a little time with us and learn about our yards. Um, this, this particular presentation will be called uh, Insect Control 101. So this is going to be the, the do-it-yourself guide. Um, and what I wanted to do is take uh, a little bit of time and look at things around the home and around the lawn and landscape. Uh, I know there's lots of information out there that's about Oh, what to do in your garden and those sorts of things. So I thought this would be a good way to just uh, maybe look from a, a little different perspective from what you usually see out there. Um, and, and really to do that, I think it's important that we take a little time. And I just want to go over the background, get some general life cycle basics. Um, all this is is just so you understand at what point uh, are these bugs giving you a problem and at what point we may consider control of them and those kinds of things. And again, we'll, we'll just identify some common ones, and uh, what I'd like to do is just go through uh, what experience I had as an applicator. So once upon a time when I would go out and um, we had, oh, probably 300 customers, I took care of their lawns and, and sprayed for them and that sort of thing. And when I did, um, these were the kind of the common things that I would run into. And then we also added some, some household things, some questions that I would get. Um, you know, or, or, or questions that I myself would have as a homeowner, you know, how do I get rid of X pests in the house? So we're going to take a little time and, and go over that today. And then once we've ID'd some, I'll mention some insecticide fairly quickly, but then we'll spend a little time on that, choosing the right insecticide, uh, some basic safety, and, and really kind of looking at those labels because sometimes that can be really confusing for everybody who's, anybody who's opened up a label, they start going and then all of a sudden, None of it makes sense. You thought you knew what you were doing, and then it all kind of falls apart on you again. So we'll spend a little time looking at that. And then uh, retreatments, you know, this isn't like a lawn where you have a real seasonality. Um, you may have periods where things really get out of control, and then you may have them under control again. So uh, we'll be answering some questions on that. <coughs> so a little bit of background. We just have to know insects have been with us, I'm sure, since there were people. Um, they thrive off the activity of humans. We our methods of, let's say for example, in the lawn where we, we want this perfect monoculture of several different, you know, all the same species of plants, you know, we go out in the garden and we, make, you know, we plant rows of everything nice and, and pretty for them to eat, and those practices just provide them with endless food, you know, it's just if something really likes it, boy, we just planted a whole field of it for them, and that really helps them with their reproduction and going, and, and, and that's why we have such a, an issue with insects. We also give them, you know, shelter to hide and breed in, um, and then we kind of compete with their natural predators. We may, through our insecticide practices, wipe out the natural insects too, and so you get these breakouts of some various ones, um, or even some of the larger pests that may feed on insects, we no longer uh, allow them to be around the house, so we, 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 we wipe out those as well. So what don't we like about bugs? Um, but people dislike them for a variety of reasons. Most of the time they're, you know, threatening or spoiling food. Uh, they're a human parasite, uh, a physical threat, something like a spider or a tick or a flea, something that, that we feel threatened by. Um, or they'll do vis visual or structural damage to property. And, and in that I'm going to also include our landscape plants. So, you know, we have those, the, everybody spent money on their landscape trying to keep that nice and doing that. And that's property damage when they come in and wipe that out for you or they do damage to it. So um, these are the things that we're looking to prevent with, with what we're going to look at today. <clears throat> and so this is the, the life cycle of an insect most people are pretty familiar with. Uh, this is the old butterfly story. You know, you start out as a caterpillar and you keep on going and then before you know it, you've got a butterfly. Um, and that starts with the egg, which would be this first little, little bit here. And you have a, a smaller uh, little worm that starts. And the guy gets bigger, and he gets bigger after each successive molt. Um, and as he gets bigger, guess what? He eats a whole lot more. Um, so why this is important to you is you really want to get these insects controlled in these first stages when they're small, vulnerable, and as soon as you see them. If you wait till he's in this big or last instar stage, your, your control's pretty limited. And in the adult stage, uh, most of the time, that's not where our feeding problems are. It's usually in the juvenile stage where we're causing damage. But they'll just go through these different instars, is what they're called, and they'll molt multiple times before they get to an adult. But the easiest way to identify an adult insect is usually there's wings on it. If it's something that has wings on it, it's fully grown. Uh, if it's any other, other deal, that's not quite grown. And then in, in this sort of situation, we're going to have this, this pupa, 
and that's going to turn into a butterfly or a moth or a wasp or something like that. Um, and that's a little different from another sort of life cycle. This is, you know, a grasshopper that you're familiar with. And they hatch and they're just like a little mini-me. And they just keep getting a little bigger all the way up until they're winged. Um, so that's the other thing that you might run into uh, with insects where they have in this life cycle where they're just, each successive instar, they just get into these small nips. Um, and if you see these in these small stages, again, that's the time to get them. If we wait till they're all super big and mature, uh, a lot of times they're very difficult to kill with the insecticide that we've got out there. Uh, and again, the wings are an indicator that you've got adults. Um, if, they're, if they're unwinged, they're usually a juvenile or not quite mature yet. So in the overview of this, we're just, we're just wanting to identify things that I've run into on the landscape, show you pictures of their damage, and what, what, what I like to do is determine an acceptable threshold. So, this is obviously a subjective term. Um, my wife's threshold for spiders may be way different than, than my threshold for spiders. She may get up there and see that and one spider is not an acceptable threshold for her. Me, I may, it may take a couple. So you'll have to just kind of determine that for yourself, you know. Can I see one or two and that doesn't maybe bother me or I don't want to see nothing. Um, so you just need to determine what your goals are as far as that is and then you know right then if that you know, if that threshold's there, oh, I've seen those two, I need, to, I need to treat it. Or I've seen more than one here or there, you need to treat. And that's, that's really how you're going to determine whether, when you're going to go after them. And then, you know, just use the best practices to prevent future problems. Maybe these, this happened for a reason. You know, maybe I did something that's causing these outbreaks over and over again. Or maybe I need to be prepared, knowing that it happens every year at this time, and control them in advance. So you just, you, you just have to get a sense for when do I see these things, when do they become problems, and add that prevention to your uh, schedule as well. So we'll start out with the lawn, just some common lawn ones. Uh, cutworms, uh, we know these mainly from the garden because they'll come through and maybe you just planted that new tomato plant and they just nip it a couple times at the base and boy the tomato plant just falls over. Also in corn or something like that, small plants as they come up. And they do the same thing for your grass. Um, They'll just come through and they'll leave these one to two inch brown spots in the yard um, and just, they don't cause a lot of damage, but they're annoying enough that they can, they can do some. Um, but they, they have this tunnel-like damage that you'll see segmented through the yard. Um, a type of cutworm is army worms. I don't know if anyone's been familiar with those. This, these are actually all worms there uh, going through and they just, they just hatch in these gigantic masses. Um, and in western Kansas, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever seen them, uh, you'll see all of a sudden across I-70 it's dark. And it's just this mat of dead worms that people have been hitting on the highway. Um, but they, they travel in the hundreds of thousands and they just mow a path through everything. So it's not a common thing for us to see around here, but just understand that that does naturally happen. It's just a very large outbreak of cutworms. Um, and there's just thousands of individuals and they'll graze the whole planet. Um, you know, hopefully that never happens to you, but they can leave <laughs> some pretty significant damage as they mow through areas. Uh, this is more common, what we see, that's just sort of an extreme one I thought was kind of interesting on the, but that's just all worms there, all those little black spots. Um, but you can see the swath where they just came right on through here, and you can't see this first tree, but it's defoliated as well, and they just march through and cut right through and just make a big old swath through, through your yard or landscape. It's not common to see the outbreaks, but occasionally you will, and so if you ever do, um, that's what it is. But this is more, more common. This is some low mode turf, so you can really see the, the C shape or that cut worm where he just kind of goes through and he's just cutting each little plant off as he goes on through. Um, but you just, it's one of those early season ones you see them first in May, June. I'm going to write down or put up here these insecticides. What I want you to do is not get too excited about what they are because they're, they're, they're basically just going to be the chemical names. So that way it cuts through whatever product you choose to use. You may find that you already have a label for them. But I'll just put some common ones up here as we go through. Um, a real big one for lawns, probably white grubs is the most common lawn pest. Um, I would definitely hold this higher than cutworms as far as damage goes. Um, and they like to attack the root system of the turf. So essentially what they're going to do is they're going to come through and they're just going to start eating the tender roots as you go through and you'll see this drought stress. You know, you come out in your yard and everything seemed to be okay 
and all of a sudden you see this, it almost looks like the lawn was dry, but you may say, oh, I have plenty of water, what's going on? And you can go grab this little tuft of grass, something like that, and it will not be attached. You'll just pull it right up, and it just pulls right out. Now, if it's disease or something like that, you'll find that grass to be firmly attached. So it, you'll go down a pole, and it'll stay stuck to the ground. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll still have a root system intact. Um, but they just, they just eat that. Uh, now, there's over 200 species of these small C-shaped grubs. Uh, we don't care about 198 of them. There's just two <laughs> mainly that, that cause this problem, and that's the May-June beetle. So you're familiar with June bugs. Everybody sees those around. Um, it's their kids that cause a lot of this damage. And the smaller versions are southern mass shapers, and they cause most of the damage. Uh, so this one-year one is much more severe than these larger three-year grubs. Um, a lot of the ones that don't, that are often mistaken, you may open up your yard and see a bunch of them, but they may be something like Japanese beetle that feeds on thatch and doesn't really attack the root system. Um, so a lot of times what we'll do is, is we'll put insecticide or something down in this time frame. So we're sitting here, this is May, June, July. Uh, you know, we're wanting to get right in this time frame after they breed that you have that insecticide in place and then it just wipes them out for that season. And that's, that's usually your best bet to prevent grubs. And with grub control, I like to kind of think of it as insurance. You know, when you're going through, if you've ever had grubs before, you don't want them. So you can, you can ensure that you won't by an application, you know, somewhere in there. Or you can kind of gamble and wait and see. Because uh, it does take a lot of grubs to do. So, you know, your yard can tolerate naturally quite a bit of damage. Um, a lot of times if you have good weather and that sort of thing, you can tolerate up to 10 grubs per square foot. Um, that's a lot of grubs, you know, per square foot, if you think about it. But you can tolerate it. Anything over that, you start seeing pretty significant damage. And as they grow, of course, they eat more, and then, then more damage comes on. So stopping them again at that first end star, really light, uh, is the best way to do it. They'll go for any grass. <laughs> Yeah, they'll go for any grass. They're pretty indiscriminate as far as root systems go. They're in gardens, whatever, that's just kind of how they go. Um, and the damage, again, will look like drought stress. You know, you'll just see it and you'll think, oh, I need a water or something like that. But it, it needs water because the root system's gone. That's why it looks that way. But again, most vulnerable and young. And the, the insecticides we'll use will be a little more specific. I like to use a metacloprid or a celeprin for those. And the reason why is they're a, a systemic one and they have a larger window. Something like seven or Dilox, you've got that day or week, you know, and if you didn't hit them at the right time and some came on later, there's nothing hanging out or systemic in the plant to help you. This is liquid? Uh, correct. It'll be liquid or granular. You can go either way with, with these. A Acelaprin is this new one that's out there, but Amidacloprid is kind of the, the standby that people will use today. Um, and again, the Carbaryl, Permethrin, Dilox, that's uh, okay, I waited, I need to fix it. You know, I, I see the grubs, I got a problem, we got to fix it. Um, so it's a, it's a follow-up treatment, but these are great preventative. Um, the next one we'll look at will be a, a common lawn pest that's not really a pest to your lawn, but sure is to you, uh, ticks. There's really no damage associated with ticks as far as plants go, uh, but you will notice that they have uh, eight legs, similar to a spider in that sense. Um, and they are parasitic to humans and animals, and really, this falls into that category of a threat to me. You know, I, I look out there and I say, hey man, this is threatening uh, us. And, and the main threat comes from the spread of Lyme disease. Um, if any of you have known somebody that's had that as a tough disease to deal with, and it's, it's a pretty chronic disease. And so uh, one of the ways to prevent that, ticks have uh, an extremely eccentric life cycle. They kind of come in these weird waves. And so uh, they can be a lot earlier than you think. A lot of people associate them with warm weather, but they can really do damage in cold weather too. And that's sometimes people don't think about that. You know, in those early spring times, they really come on. And then, you know, maybe in the summer, you don't see them as much as they spread out. But they can become a problem. And they can be many different sizes. So, you know, there's several different varieties of ticks. Now, hopefully, you've never seen one of these on you that size. But on animals and livestock that aren't able to pick them off, they, they will become engorged. So you may see these large green things on there and say, hey, what is that? Well, that's a tick too, it's just full. Um, and they can be tough to kill, and this is where we get in these gaps. You know, we may buy a bag of insecticide or a spray, and we go spray at the rate for ants or something like that, and we're not picking up the ticks. They require about twice the insecticide that ants or something uh, smaller could. Um, and they require high, high rates on the label. And so that's another 
uh, reason why they can be so uh, dangerous, if you will, or they may sneak up on you is because a lot of times we may be treating, thinking we're getting them, and we're not following that label right. Uh, but bifenthrin, permethrin, 7, those are all good choices for ticks. They do a nice job. There's not a lot of resistance for ticks like there is uh, for flies or some of the other ones. Uh, so they do work pretty well when you get them at the right rates. Um, one that I call is kind of almost like, uh, it looks like a micro tick. It's a really small guy. Uh, chiggers are another common one that people see. Now this is a mite. So this is a very, very, very small yeah, I mean, it'd be, uh, a person with perfect vision can barely see a chigger. Um, and an adult chigger is perfectly red, but they don't attack you. It's the juveniles that come after you, um, and they are a type of mite. And just, I can't stress enough the very, how small they are. So it's very difficult for you to see them or know they're there. Usually you just feel the results of them after your 4th of July party or something like that. Uh, again, no damage to plants but they certainly can irritate us. Um, so people react to them differently, uh, but they can cause these itchy reactions uh, as they feed. And they can be, you know, you thought ticks were hard to kill. Chiggers is another one of those would be double the tick rate. Because they're a mite, they're extremely resistant to most of the insecticides. So it requires a really high rate to knock them out. Um, and so those rates are gonna approach double what the ticks are. So again, People go out and they spray and they wonder why they have issues thinking they're getting rid of them. Make sure that we're getting enough insecticide down for things like ticks and chiggers. Um, and the ones I've seen with chiggers on the label are like are, are bifenthrin or lambda cyhalothrin. Um, the type of chemical, you'll just have to look in and find mites on the label and you can use it as a general miticide. <laughs> so again, if we don't want this, just make sure that we're using the right rate so that way we're knocking them out. Um, now we move on to landscape pets, so this is out of the yard. When we look at this, uh, this is kind of a unique one. Um, they're called sawfly larvae, and you'll see them in early spring. And if you guys have mugo pines, or some people have uh, scotch pines, you'll see these uh, oftentimes, and they're kind of weird. You know, I remember the first time I experienced them, uh, we were out in a class, and we walked by, and I get close to this pine, and all of a sudden the whole thing just moves in unison. I was like, what in the world is that? And these, these worms will actually flinch all at the same time. And it's kind of creepy when you see them, and they just, you can actually hear them just chewing on the pine needles as they go by. Now, they really do strip these down, and they do it really fast. And they're uh, Mugo, Austrian, Scots, but sometimes you'll see them on spruces and deciduous trees, but they don't do near the damage because the, the deciduous trees especially can recover. Um, your, your pines and those sorts of things don't recover as well. Uh, if there is any, you know, this would be an extensive sawfly outbreak. You can see trees like this where they're completely defoliated. And what's interesting about it is, is these guys, because they're so early, do not damage the current year's growth. So you'll see them almost completely look to come out of it uh, within a month or two as those new candles develop and you get fresh ones. So I guess they're not dumb. They're going to wait so they have plenty to eat next year. And they leave that so that the tree stays alive. Now the problem is is if you continually lose that second and third year needle where most of the foods produced for this tree, you're just going to have a decline. So every year after every year, that's where saw flies really get you. If you just see them every year after every year after every year, constantly eating your food producing needles, uh, your, your tree is going to run out of gas and go into the decline. And uh, it's not a sole factor, but it can be a contributing factor to, to Scott's pines going down or some of these little ornamental pines uh, losing out. They're easy to kill, you know, seven, carbaryl um, would be the chemical name for it, permethrin. All of them die pretty easy. It's just knowing when to look for them, scouting for them in the early May. This is one of the first insect pests in the landscape that I'll notice. <coughs> um, this is another one that's real common, bagworms. I think everybody's seen bagworms or had an issue with bagworms. Um, and they create this, this cocoon of silk around them, but they interweave whatever they're feeding on uh, into the bag. And so it kind of camouflages them for a while, of course, but they're going to be dead. Uh, so they'll, they'll have these dark, dark colors as opposed to the live tissue. But you'll just see them, and this is actually what the guy looks like. You can see them at the top of the bag. Um, they are a one-generation pest, so if you spray them once, as soon as you see them, that's it for the year. You can really knock them out um, the whole way. Um, but they do appear in this May to June, so now would be the time. Uh, I've seen them out in the landscape. They're really, really tiny right now. They still make their bag. You know, you'll still see the bags on there. 
And, but what you'll do is you'll start to see the trees just kind of just look a little brown and something just doesn't look quite white with them. And, and they shouldn't look like that because you've got all this moisture, all this you know time in June, but you have this uh, bagworm starting to appear. And this is kind of, you know, here you got an unaffected tree to the right and you see this kind of looking sick over here. Uh, that's pretty typical of what a bagworm looks like from a distance when you're looking at trees. But they can cause damage to any tree or shrub. I mean, I've seen them on uh, all types of trees, birch trees, maple trees, and they make bags out of that. Uh, they're a threat to evergreens because evergreens don't have any backup buds. You can take every leaf, you know, come and handpick every leaf off of a maple tree, and in three weeks it'll be completely refoliated by its backup buds. Uh, evergreens don't have that ability. Uh, once they're defoliated, it's a really severe hit to them. And so that's why you usually see more of a problem on evergreens. And where they come from is they'll hatch out. The eggs are actually contained in those bags um, that are left on the plant at the end of the year. So if you come up and you see these old, dead, decayed bagworms, in those bags, 50% of them anyway, uh, or the female bags that remain, that's where the eggs are, and that's where they hatch out of every year. So a trick is, if you want to know when the hatch is, is to take uh, half a dozen bags or whatever and put them in a Ziploc bag or maybe in an old quart jar and just set them up in the windowsill there in the spring, and as soon as you see them hatch out, well, you know in a couple weeks you're going to want to spray because uh, they'll be a little slower because you'll be inside where it's warm. Uh, but, you know, as soon as, as soon as they hatch out, that's how we used to be an indicator when I was in a landscape company uh, to do that. But they, again, they're pretty easy to kill. Bifrenthin, permethrin, spinosad, um, any of those work well. The biggest thing is timing. Just scout for them. They're, they're there now if they're going to be there. And if you have a history of them and you've seen those old female bags hanging up there, you can guarantee they're going to be there the next year because that's where they come from. Um, so it's pretty easy once you know what you're doing. Now this one's often called a bagworm, but this is not a bagworm. This is this is webworm. It's called fall webworm because we'll see it uh, throughout the fall in the east. But you, you really what happens should be late summer, you know, bagworm. You know, if you want to call it late summer webworm or something like that. But uh, they spin this protective web as they feed. So as they come out. Um, you'll just see this web start to develop around and then they just defoliate and munch on whatever's in there being protected by that web. But they don't come out of the web um, and they are a type of caterpillar. Here's some more damage that you can see it's a little more extensive. Um, but they like to go after walnut and locust trees. That's usually what I see them in in our area. Um, to get rid of them you can just prune out the damage. If this let's say was a lower branch or uh, kind of like this one was and you just came in and just snipped it right there. That's okay, you can prune it out um, and get rid of it. Uh, sometimes that's impractical, especially if you have a large tree. But what you're gonna do when you go spray is you wanna spray not just the, the bag area or the webbed area, but the rest of the tree too. So as they move into the area, uh, then they're gonna come in contact with that insecticide because that web does a pretty darn good job of protecting them even from spraying. Um, so you just have to be aware of that when you see them. But locust, people who have locusts and walnut trees, uh, you've, you've probably seen that guy. This one's a little less common. Uh, I have seen this uh, maybe only once, but it looks so much like the other one. These are called tent caterpillars. So what they do is they find a crotch in the tree and they make what looks like, just like the fall webworm, but instead it's just a tent and they leave the tent and go feed in the tree and then at night come, come back for refuge and shelter. Um, so the caterpillars leave during the day. Now, you can prune that out, but that's a pretty significant pruning if it's the center of your tree. Uh, if it's a side branch, you may consider doing that, but that bag is almost impossible to actually get insecticide into. So what I usually do is, again, spray the whole tree, and then when they come out to feed, you're gonna, they're going to run into your insecticide that way, rather than try and focus on where they're, they're protected. Uh, but that's spinosad, bifenthrin, permethrin, any of those are pretty easy. And again, we'll go over a little bit choosing that insecticide later. Uh, now this um, is a mite. This is another common, uh, and it looks like basically if you want to call it a tick for plants, that's about right. You know, the same sort of concept. They're going to go in and feed on that uh, vascular tissue of the plant, sucking up the juices that way. Um, so they feed on the sap, the sugary flow throughout the plant, and they're really small. Again, they're, they're super little, and most of the ones we'll see are these spider mites, so they're extremely small and red. 
so they may look like chiggers, and sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference because they're small like that. Uh, but these would be like chiggers for plants. Um, but they cause damage, and they, they, they cause them to start to look deflated. Uh, they begin to yellow. Uh, but the pattern doesn't quite follow drought stress. So you'll see this yellowing and this uh, kind of indiscriminate sickness that kind of looks in there, and the plant just looks like a little sick. But if it was drought stress, you would notice this on the margins of the leaf or coming from the end and scorching back. Here you're seeing it kind of indiscriminately and spotty where they're sucking the sap out. Uh, the one caveat to this is, and rarely do I say not to use this one because this is a pretty good insecticide, uh, but don't use imidacloprid when it comes to mites. So imidacloprid, uh, lack of a better term, kind of forces, opens up the vascular flow of the plants a little bit. Uh, it's just kind of a side effect of it, and it basically just turns it into a super buffet for the, the mites, if you will, and it doesn't, it isn't as strong enough rate where it'll kill them. So you can actually make a, a bad mite problem really worse if you use a midacloprid. So that's probably the only time I would say not, you know, just take that one off your list. But uh, the old school ones like acephate or high rates of bifenthrin or hexagon, Again, they're, they're back in that tough to kill thing, just like the chigger mites were. Uh, so again, can be tough to kill with those traditional insecticides, and you'll see this deflation. And what I like to do is if you suspect it, get a white note card or something like that, and just come under and smack the plants a little bit, um, and then just look really closely, maybe even get a magnifying glass out, and you'll see these little clear things crawling around, but you're looking for these red deals uh, these little red bugs crawl around, they'll, they'll contrast out on that white piece of paper. And that's how you can tell if you got spider mites start. <clears throat> okay, so that's kind of the main landscape ones that you'll run into. Um, and, and now I'll talk a little bit about household pests. So the household pests are um, something that we all deal with every day. These are the ones that really thrive off the environment that we thrive off of. You know, we're, we're creating these, you know, climate controlled environments inside. We're providing food for them everywhere and uh, all these structures for them to eat. Uh, so we'll kind of look at these a little bit. So the most, we'll start at the beginning alphabetically. We'll just go ants, huh? Um, but ants uh, are identified by this, this, these three body segments that they have. They have this head and then a, a thorax or the center and then abdomen. And uh, the reason why that's important is when you compare them to termites, they're, they're gonna look a little different. But they have this waste, if you will. Uh, termites just have a solid body on through. Um, but they can be a structural threat if you're talking about carpenter ants or something like that. Uh, they'll burrow through wood, chomp it down in order to, to, to build tunnels for storage of food and, and young and that kind of thing. Uh, but they are different from termites of the three body segments. But carpenter ants will still have these piles of what we call frass, which is just a nice way of saying insect poop uh, that's combined together. And they have this... It, it looks kind of like sawdust, but it'll be finer because it's been ground by the mandibles of the, you know, the, the insects sitting there chewing them up rather than you using a chainsaw or something like that. So they're finer. They can also be a little sticky because it has been through the digestive system of an insect. But you'll see these little piles up here and you'll wonder, what in the world is that? You know? uh, and that's some sign that there's something going on inside there. Um, but ants aren't tough to kill. They're only tough to kill because of where they hide. Because they're in the ground or back in there, uh, it makes it difficult, so you have to get them as they come out. So this is, this is where bait may be a good option for ants. If you have a, a perennial problem with ants, I got ants everywhere, baits, they take back to their home and they distribute it throughout their colony and you can really kill them that way. If you just have to spray around the top, you're relying on them to come out. Well, they may withstand that just by you know, new ones hatching and then coming out and then she lays more eggs and then they come out and that mist may wear out your insecticide and keep going. Um, now they can, they can also be, uh, we don't have fire ants in our area yet, but they can be a little bit of a threat to people, especially in the southern states. They really worry about uh, fire ants because of their aggression and that sort of thing. Um, but you can use the, the traditional insecticides and if you are spraying your yard pretty regularly, uh, likely you're not going to see a lot of this problem. Um, now, termites, on the other hand, uh, you'll notice that they look really similar to ants. Um, but the biggest difference is, is that they have this big old segment in the back 
and they don't really look like they have a waist in the abdomen. So a lot of times you'll see a breeder ant and think you got termites, but it's, you know, look a little closer. But they cause billions of dollars in structural damage every year. That's billions with a B. That's a lot of damage. Um, and they do that because we use our structures, we build them out of wood, which is their favorite food. You know, they eat and digest wood. Uh, so we just build up these structures for them and they just come along and start deteriorating them and digesting them. Um, and because of that, it's probably one of the, the few ones that I'll say, uh, the threshold zero, guys. I mean, you, you can't have any termites around or you're going to start losing your structures that you spent a lot of money on. Uh, so this may be one that you have a professional company do their preventative treatments. Now, the stuff that we have does a great job for protecting a deck or something exposed. Uh, but the, the professional guys do the subterranean part. You know, that's the thing is if they're burrowed underground and they come in from the underground into your house, there really isn't any, they never come across your insecticide. There's no place for them to do that. Um, and again, this is another little compare and contrast. You see the ants have wings that aren't always the same size. Uh, they can part at the base. The termite, the wings stack on top of each other and they almost look identical. And another way indicator is, is when you look at the antennae, they're, they're straight like this. Uh, ants can bend, they have almost an elbow in it, if you're looking at it, uh, and so that's one other thing you can look at. But they're, and they're, they're narrow in this, this middle part of the body right here um, versus termites. Uh, so one of the other few insects, again, that you're going to treat before you feel. Now they're easy to kill. I mean, you can go in there and spray them and they'll die. Again, it's getting to them. You know, once they get in your structures, how do you get that insecticide dispersed where you need to disperse it? Um, all right, so we talked about my wife's threshold for spiders. You can guarantee it ain't very high. Uh, so she doesn't like spiders, um, and there are many different species of spiders, but the one that I'll talk about is probably brown recluse. That's one that most people are familiar with, and it's so common. I mean, uh, it'd be rare to find a house that doesn't have these spiders. They really like uh, attics and conditions, garages, uh, areas like that. Um, and I, I would say... That's the reason why I call them the most dangerous, is because they live right among us. Um, and if you haven't seen a brown leopard spot, I'm not going to gross you out or anything, but it basically just starts to digest your tissue. So it, if it takes the body, you know, the skin on your arm starts to digest. And it's not a pleasant uh, thing to think about, but it is something to be aware of, and it is something you'll want to uh, consider controlling, especially if you find them dead, uh, sitting around, or it, you know, when you're sweeping and you look in your dust pile and you see a little spider, what I want you to do is just check and look on the back of this guy. It's got a great ID feature of a little violin. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it just looks like a little guitar or violin right on the top of their back. And no other spider really has anything that looks like this. And this is their size, so in comparison to a quarter. And uh, I wouldn't freak out and say, oh, I need to spray everything. But what I would do is just, you know, when you sweep things up, when you look at things and you see dead insects or spiders around, just check to see if you did see that, and if you do see them, uh, then I would get a little bit more aggressive with the treatment of them. Um, and you can use things like sticky traps, you know, in the corners of the attics or things as they move around uh, to, to pick them up. And, and what the sticky traps can do is not just control them, but indicate to you that, oh, I got them around here. So the, the sticky trap in your house, uh, what that can do is just bugs are going to walk across there randomly. And what a great scouting tool, you know, hey, oh, I do have this around, you know. Um, so they, they do work as a scouting tool. But uh, a permanent way is, you know, it's, you know, we're all busy, but removing clutter, we all like to store things and rattle things and put things in boxes and shove them up in corners and that, and that, they just love that. That's, they, they uh, thrive off clutter and then they eat other household pets, you know, the little silver fish or some of these other small inside insects that you'd see. Um, so spraying insecticide at the spider rate on the label. So this is another one that would be similar to ticks as far as the rate that you would use to control them. Um, so you're going to have to heft it up a little bit when you're, when you're adding uh, spiders to it. So you may uh, have that you know, light rate or let's just use an example of a third of an ounce per gallon or something for ants or termites or those kinds of things. Uh, remember to jack it up if you have spider issues, tick issues, those kinds of things. But again, permethrin, bifenthrin, cypermethrin are good ones. Um, we all know what this one is. Hopefully this is the ID that everybody knows is cockroaches. Um, hopefully it's not something you have to run in often in your house, uh, but it certainly happens, and they just absolutely love everything that we leave for them. Okay. 
Uh, so any little waste that you have hey. putting in one place or the other, oh. um, they just love to eat all the food waste that we have sitting around. There are a few different types, but in the presence of food, they really explode. So once the food's there, all of a sudden they become present, then they breed and just really get going. Um, so you just have to, once you get into the part where you have a problem, boy, they're pretty persistent um, and tough to come out with. So these are some examples of cockroaches in many different sizes. So here you have them. This cockroach is the same as that cockroach. This is the baby. And remember those different sizes we talked about as those, they, they get bigger. And if you ever see these things, these are their egg sacs. So they just kind of attach near the base and they kind of carry it around for a while and then just like uh, let it go. And then all of a sudden you get them hatching out in these small versions and they start to grow as they, they get bigger. So you may see, uh, you may think it's a bunch of different kinds of cockroaches, but in reality it's just a bunch of different life stages. And if you see a bunch of different life stages, that means, boy, they've been breeding at your place. So that's, that's not always a good sign. If you see one big adult here and there, that's not such a big deal. But if you see multiple sizes, of egg sacs, this whole deal, uh, they've been there a while and they're real dug in. So in these cases, you may want to use a multi-pronged approach to eradicate them. Um, use your traditional insecticides. Uh, the way a professional would do it is he would come into the house and he would spray underneath the countertops and around the edges and the borders and the floor and those sorts of things. But they don't like to be there. They like to be in, in crawling and hiding and in the walls and that kind of thing. And uh, so what they'll do is they'll take a, a bomb or a, a something with a pyrethrin in it that's an irritant and they release it and that drives them out of their hiding places onto the insecticide that he had sprayed waiting for. Uh, so that's kind of how a commercial guy would do it. The other thing they'll do is they'll add a growth regulator to it. And so um, that's something that's not common uh, as far as when you go buy uh, over-the-counter products. You know, if you go in and buy them, usually they're not going to contain a growth regulator because they're not real stable. But uh, getting those growth regulators added, what that does is it just wipes out the entire next generation. So if you have a growth regulator in place, those insects hatch, they can't form their outer shell on the, as an insect, so they just die. So what that does is it just puts a stopping point to the whole deal, and it just says the whole next generation is gone and uh, can wipe it out for you. Um, so again, those bombs uh, that they call don't work great on their own. They're, they're, they're actually hard, not very effective at all if you just put one of those off and walk out. Now you may kill some stuff, but you do that in combination with spraying it on the floor and in the areas that are exposed, you can really do some damage to these guys. Um, so moving on from there, uh, bed bugs are one that we've seen in the news a little bit, uh, so I thought I'd include it, especially like uh, back east they have some problems with these, uh, places with high concentrations of people. Uh, but they're a parasite that live in and around our bedding, and uh, they're just kind of these funky little guys. They, they kind of look like a flea, but not really. They, um, and they just sit around, and then when we go to bed at night, they crawl out. You know that little saying, don't let the bed bugs bite? Well, that, it's real. They, there are bed bugs, and they will bite you. And they, they just get a blood meal at night, uh, and then go back to hiding out during the day. Um, and this is kind of an indication when you, when you strip off your bedding uh, and start to, to go wash it every now and then. If you ever start seeing these black dots, that's actually blood, which is kind of gross. Um, if you, then you'll start seeing these little, there's some in the small stages and then the adult stages, and they'll just uh, hide around in certain spots and then come out. Um, so again, you know, those of us who are really good at washing or bedding or that sort of stuff or aren't exposed to an environment, you know, your house is isolated, these really become a problem in apartment complexes and rental properties and, and things like that. These can really get out of hand. Um, and the, the remediation for it is to clean the bedding in very hot water. Um, the mattress usually has to go. Um, and you can use permethrin, cypermethrin, they're pretty easy to kill. Um, and then use a growth regulator if you're going to keep the mattress or that sort of thing. You need to wait till it's dry, don't sleep on it that night. Let it kind of, you know, you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, does that growth regulator, does that work on other insects like ants? And it will, yes. And uh, like the big difference is, is you want to use a growth regulator usually inside. Because growth regulators are not stable because they break down in sunlight. So you won't usually see them used outside because they don't last very long. But inside they are dynamite because they don't have that exposure to break down so fast. 
And that's why we're using them on the household ones that are inside because, boy, they can really make an impact. Um, and they're usually a bigger problem in cities, especially like New York, that bans the insecticides that you would use to kill them. Uh, so they kind of create their own problem there. You know, you can't buy permethrin to kill them. Well, there's nothing to kill them. You, you know, they just run rampant and they have to call commercial people to come in and do it. Um, you can't take care of them yourself. And so that, you know, they're creating their own problem there. Um, but luckily we live in Kansas, so that's pretty easy for us to just go and, and buy it over the counter and get rid of them. Um, moving on from them, uh, one other household pest, and usually, you know, in the household, we, we have a lot of companions in our household. Uh, we'll call that our cats and our dogs that, that like to go out and find these things and bring them home to you. Um, and when that happens, uh, you know, if you, you just have to scout your, your pets when you're grooming them or, or looking at them. And, and they'll let you know because they'll be biting on themselves and those kinds of things. And you'll just see these little things wiggling around so fast you can hardly see, and every once in a while they'll just disappear. Um, that's kind of what a flea is. Um, but they're very small and fast, uh, and they will jump around. This is kind of to scale here. So they're not very big, you know. Um, but they're a bigger problem on pets. Usually they'll only feed on humans if a whole bunch of them bred, and they're everywhere, and then food is withdrawn. The dogs leave or something and they're really hungry, uh, they will. But they really particularly like pets more than they do people. Um, this is an indicator also on your pet's hair. You'll see this is the, the waste of the, uh, or the, like the frass of a flea, if you will. You'll see all these little black dots and stuff uh, to indicate that there's been fleas on there if you can't actually see the live fleas. Um, and they can become resistant to permethrin. Um, and permethrin is the cheap version of the spot-ons that you use. So you'll actually pour concentrated permethrin insecticide on them and it's a really inexpensive uh, chemical which is good and does a pretty good job. But we've seen them start to become a little resistant to that. That's why Frontline came out and was so great uh, because it was able to wipe those out. Um, the new ones you may, may hear about uh, imidacloprid, that's Advantix if you're familiar with that spot-on for your pets. Um, you know, frontline is fipronil, um, is another chemical that, that we can also use, but fipronil is still pretty commercialized, usually only commercial guys have access to it. Um, we of course have it at the store, but it's not as uh, cheap or cost effective as using these other ones that still work pretty darn good for you. Um, the other thing to consider with fleas is it really seems to work great with the fresh insecticide, but then you have this lingering problem with all the eggs their eggs last a little longer than some of the other ones. So using these wettable soluble powders, I've got a couple of examples of them up there. As they break down, they release fresh insecticides. So they're coarser particles, so they're not immediately exposed to what degrades the chemical. And so they, what they do is they, they last longer. They just keep releasing this fresh stuff and it can knock them out. And then again, combine with that growth regulator inside. That growth regulator is excellent. And you will see that in a lot of spot-ons. Uh, they'll have this growth regulator added to them. Uh, but again, it's not, it's usually only photo stable for like 14 days. You know, just that's, they're great, but they require often, you know, retreatment. So, uh, you know, a lot of you are here, and we'll, we'll be using insecticides to kind of help control these once we've exhausted, you know, any other method we might think to help. Um, but choosing the right insecticide is important, and you just need to ask yourself some real basic questions. You know, am I going to be using this inside, or am I going to be using it outside? Uh, do I need one that I can use on my pets as well as in my house? You know, um, do I want one that is ready to use, like this ortho home defense one here? Uh, or do I want to buy the concentrate, like this bifenthrin? And that's, and the, the interesting thing is, is, you know, we kind of want to go at these companies and say, oh man, you know, they're ripping us off, look at that. But in reality, we kind of do it to ourselves. We, we're lazy, we don't like to read the labels, we don't like to go in there and mix stuff ourselves. And so what they did was, instead of just having one product sitting there on their shelf and saying, oh yeah, it does it all, they go out and they specifically make it. They make a roach killer, they make an ant killer, they make a home defense max, they make all these different things out of the same chemical but they, they really market it to different things. So you may go in your, and I, I challenge you to do this right now. You can go home and find all those homeowner products and if you look at that active ingredient line, you know, 50% of them are all the same thing. You know, maybe a little different concentrations depending on the label, but you can mix it yourself and save yourself a lot of money, um, you know, mixing up your own, your own sprays and own chemicals. But again, 
make sure it's on the label, make sure we're at the right rate, and when you start doing this for yourself, you need to make sure that you're accurate, because that's the other thing that we're not always good at as homeowners. We think, oh, a little's good, a lot's better be better, and you know, they dump more in than they need to, uh, and that can cause problems like, uh, an example would be, uh, cats are pretty reactive to permethrin, and if you accidentally put a spot on for a dog that's permethrin on a cat, it'll kill it. Um, so they're very sensitive to that, and that's another reason why here we have these home. You, you need to know those things and mix them properly so you don't do things like kill your cat. Um, but is there a product that can do it all? And uh, what we found at the store is originally I got like, you know, I would do the same thing with my concentrates. I would have high yield 38 plus, I would have uh, kills a bug, I would have all these different concentrates and mixes. And then I eventually come to a product like Permethrin SFR that you can spray on your cows, you can spray on your dogs, you can spray on your house, you can spray on your garden. And they have this extremely wide label which can fix a lot of your issues with just one product and then you just make it yourself. Um, so, you know, having something with a wide label that tells you how to mix it for things, well that's pretty priceless. I mean, I really like that product because of it. Um, because you have a very versatile product that lets you get right out there and spray when you see the problem and you're, you're more likely to get them at the earlier stages and you're like, oh, I saw them, oh, I got a problem, I know I need to do something about it. And you, you, know, you get around to next Sunday or next week or something, getting out to a big box and buying the thing that says it kills it. But if you have that concentrate on hand, you can just look it right up, okay, what do I need to kill it? And you can immediately start taking care of it. Uh, and it saves you money. So where do all these insecticides that we use come from? Um, the most common ones you'll find today in about every product come from these, what we call pyrethrums. Uh, pyrethrum um, is actually from the chrysanthemum plant. So chrysanthemums have all these natural insecticides within them, and we found out, hey, if you grind them up, they kill bugs. And naturally ground up one is called pyrethrum. Um, now, what, what the scientists have done is they just look and they figured out which ones were killing insecticides, and then they, they just made one that made a chemical that was the same shape. Um, and so what they would do is they would, in pyrethrum was permethrin, bifenthrin, lambosahal, all these different chemicals that kill bugs in the same family, um, but they weren't very stable in the fact like the chrysanthemum plant. You know, they would get out there and they degrade quick in the sunlight or certain problems. And so what they would do is just synthetically make them uh, so that we could have that uh, wonderful thing that's provided uh, but be, have it be more stable and more effective. You know, just pick the best ones that kill it, not the whole thing. Um, the more ones that you probably all grew up with were organophosphates. Um, Carbaryl-7, Durasban, the chloropyphyrus, uh, diazinon, all those things uh, are organophosphate type chemicals. They're manufactured from petroleum. So they're, uh, they work great, they're good insecticides, but they also require high rates. Um, so you may need 10 times the chemical that you need here to do the same thing. Um, and that chemical, because of just the quantity you're using, it's affecting you as people and that sort of thing. And so that's why you'll, you'll notice that you know, Durasban and Diazon started to go off the market because they just kept accumulating. So you just keep dumping this stuff out and they get more and more potent and then start killing unattended things. Um, where these kill just as good as these do, but they don't last so long you know, 30 days and then they start breaking down pretty rapidly in the environment. Uh, so that's kind of the difference, they don't bioaccumulate. Some new classes, so what's new even beyond those? This neonicotinoid class, and that, that is not by accident, it is in the same sort of chemical family as nicotine. Um, Imidacloprid and amamectin, they require far less rates than even this. And so what we're doing as we advance in insecticide is we're reducing the rates way down so your exposure to quantity of chemicals down. They're getting more specific to killing insects. Um, and even some really cool ones, totally new mode of action, this is Um And the nice thing about this is, you know, you may see uh, danger on a label like this. You may see caution as a signal word on something like this. Um, on something like that, uh, they're very close to, I don't know if they have it out yet, but not even having a signal word. Uh, you know, they can't even prove that it hurts you type thing. Um, and that's pretty cool when you think about, you know, being able to use it around kids or around playgrounds and those kinds of things. Um, 
I know I, I sell this like on football fields and those kind of things. They don't want anything that's going to hurt the kids. Um, and a cell print is a, a great new way uh, where you can really reduce the amounts of insecticide you're using at safe. Um, so that's where we're heading. Um, one other thing, and I don't want to get, I know I've already been kind of technical in the chemistry, but I'll do it again. A lot of times we tend to, and I've got two examples right over there on the table. I've got bifenthrin and I've got a permethrin FSR, SFR. One of them is 7.9% concentrate, and the other one is like 37.5% concentrate. Now you look at that and say, oh, well, that 37.5, that, that's got to be better stuff. It's more concentrated. But in reality, they kill the same amount of bugs at the same rates. So why is that? Um, a lot of it has to do with these shapes of the, of the molecules that are in them. And on there by law, they have to tell you whether they're a trans isomer or a cis isomer. I know that's a little technical, but it's just the mere image of the two chemistries. And what happens is these cis isomers, much, much deadlier to insects than the trans isomers. So that one has 97% cis isomers, so you know it's a very high grade insecticide. This one has 45%. Um, so I don't put it on there other than it just tells you the quality of the insecticide that you're purchasing. You know, how good is it at killing it, not just the percentage of the active ingredients. So just don't want you to get caught in that trap of, well, it ought to be better because it's mixed stronger, you know, or there's more stuff in there. Well, there's a lot more stuff in there too, you know, this is, 46% chemical um, doesn't even doesn't kills about as much as you know what this would be at uh, excuse me at 30% which kills as much as this is at 10% you know they just keep reducing the amounts again um, but again basic safety guidelines guys just make sure you identify your pest properly so that we're not using too much insecticide all the time if you go out and spray for the chigger rate all the time yes you're going to kill bugs. But when you're up in those high rates like that, you're also going to start building resistance in the ones that survive. So just get your rates just right to the point where you're hitting your targets, and you don't have to you don't have to waste money using extra insecticide or missing what you intend. And then read that label carefully to determine your options. And remember, this isn't like herbicides. Okay, we don't really are really affected by plant hormones and those kinds of things. Uh, we certainly are affected by insecticides that uh, mess with our, our synapses in our brain, essentially, is how they work. Um, they don't allow it, the message to shut off. You know, that's how they kill an insect. So, because we have the same things as insects, it really can do it. You know, those insects can, you know, what kills an insect can also kind of kill a person. Where plants were so different, there's not as much acute danger. But uh, this can have an acute danger. You can start getting things like headaches and those kinds of things. Uh, when I was an applicator, I wore a respirator. Um, did I need to? No. Uh, but when you do it for all day, you really want to because you're just going to keep getting exposed to it and exposed to it. And uh, you get a headache by the end of the day if you didn't. Um, now the newer stuff, much less of a chance that happened than the older school stuff. But still, just be cautious of that. You know, what kills bugs can injure you as well. And then again, the label will, will, will contain requirements for you. And what that label will do is tell you, like, when can I go back on the area after I treat it? Nine times out of ten for what we're going to sell out of here. Uh, you can re-enter it. Um, you know, there's no contact with pets or people until dry. So the ones that we sell are pretty safe for the newer types. Um, so it's something that you're going to go spray and use your protective equipment. And then you just wait till it dries out, and then pets, people, you know, play, whatever can resume on it, uh, which is pretty friendly. You know, some of the old ones were nobody goes in for 24 hours, you know, or something like that. But that's pretty common for what we've got. And real quick, so I'm telling you to buy these concentrates, and I know that this label is going to cause you problems. So here we have A for ants right there at the top of both of these. Now, in this one, it says 0.4 to 0.8 ounces per thousand square feet and on this one it says four to eight ounces per hundred gallons of water now those are two rates that are so far from each other you just like how is that even possible well what this is is the difference in equipment that you're using to apply so here we're expecting you to use a pump up sprayer where you're just going to go by and kind of mist the tree as you go by and you're wanting to put that 
you know, half an ounce on a thousand square feet of, of surface, okay, and you're just misting it with a light carrier. Whereas here, we're talking about putting 14, 15 gallons on each tree, spraying it till it, you know, soaking down the whole thing. And so you're putting a lot, a similar amount of insecticide, but you're using more water as a carrier, and that's kind of the difference. So you have to just be thinking about the way that you're using it. For most of us, um, how we're going to use it is follow this, this lawn or turf rate or home or perimeter rate. And uh, an ounce per thousand, most people when they spray their pump up for sprayer will put about an ounce per thousand square feet. So that will tell you, uh, you know, I want to put 0.8 ounces in my gallon of water and I'm expecting to cover a thousand square feet, something like that. Whereas here, you know, they're expecting you to have a big old tank you know, 200 gallon spray tank and you're going to put eight ounces in that whole deal, but you're going to soak everything down when you go spray. So that's just, you know, that's just a way to look at that. Even though they're similar, there can be a wide, you know, it can be tricky to read those. Um, so just be, be careful with that. And if you have questions, call us. I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we do these things. Uh, so we can put information out there for you. But an example you know, again, eight ounces per hundred gallons versus a half ounce per gallon. That's that's quite a difference in rate. Um, as far as what else is new out there, this how often do I need to retreat? Most of the time, outside with the types of insecticides that we're using, we're talking about 30-day residual. Now, you may do all the damage you need to do and wipe out that one generation of bagworms for 30 days, and you don't have to retreat. But it may be something like ants where they just keep coming back. Um, when you get inside, we don't have sunlight, we don't have rain, we don't have all these particles interacting and all these things going on, so we can get 60 days out of most of it. Um, now, if you need longer term type chemicals, um, you can also use these controlled release. So these have uh, really very, very small coated particles in them, casings and stuff like that, so it's constantly releasing fresh insecticide, and that's where this controlled release or CS comes in these coats, or we talked about that wettable soluble powder, which is just chunkier stuff that as it breaks down over time, it, it, it does a good job of releasing fresh insecticide. Um, so again, we're just going to do a quick review before we finish up here and then we'll get to any questions. Know what bugs you, the proper ID is important, uh, that'll save you money or save you time depending on if you got a retreat or if or whatever happens there. Scout, so if you've had a, a history of a problem, I have bagworms every year over here. Well, scout them. You know, go look, and when you see them, get started. Man, I have sawflies every year. Well, scout them. Know when to go look, and then you can just see, and that way you can get them early, not late. So you're getting them when they're easier to kill. So again, easy to kill when young can be really hard to kill when they're old and mature and, and getting ready to go. And again, find, find that rate on the label, and it'll direct you to the proper rate and the safety equipment that you're going to need. Okay, so that, that'll help you out there. Um, anything I missed today? I know I didn't cover flies. I know I didn't cover mosquitoes. Um, you know, for me, I wanted to get the stuff that a lot of people don't cover. So, you got any other questions for me today? Yeah. Lady, ladybugs. Ladybugs. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good question. So, ladybugs. Um, for those of you that don't know, ladybugs actually eat other bugs. So they're in a, a par they're a, a predator to other insects but they will fall victim to your permethrins and those kinds of things. Uh, ladybugs also eat a lot of aphids. So to me, they're actually a benefit to have around. Now when they hatch, sometimes they can almost clog up your windowsills I and mean, they get so thick, but in reality, they're usually eating a pest somewhere nearby. And that's one of those ones where I mentioned earlier that you're removing that predator. Sometimes when we spray, we remove the predator or the aphids, and then all of a sudden we have an aphid problem. Any other questions? Yeah, I got two. Uh, is it true spiders have to crawl through the chemical to kill them? Uh, yes. I mean, you could spray them and it would still kill them. And that, that may be something worth mentioning there. A lot of the newer products do not have what you might call a knockdown. The older ones, the insect would dang near drop dead in its tracks and stop moving instantly because it killed it quickly with these large amounts. The newer ones, um, a lot of times it may take six hours to kill it. You know, but once it gets on there, Every time that insect sends a signal to move its leg, that signal doesn't shut off. And then it sends a signal to move it, and it doesn't shut off. And it takes a while for these to accumulate, but it eventually will kill it. 
So you may not get the knockdown that you're used to from the old types, but it'll kill. You know, you evaluate the newer insecticides in a week's time, not instantly. Man, I killed that thing five times. I know I sprayed that fly. Why ain't he dead yet? You know, it ain't always going to happen that way. You know, come back tomorrow and see if he's still around. Um, so just be cautious with that. Okay, roly polies. How do you get rid of roly polies? Um, roly polies, pill bugs, sow bugs, whatever you yeah. want to call them. Uh, another one on the easy to kill list: a perimeter treatment using permethrin or bifenthrin. Excellent job. You can just—I mean, it's almost like a wall. You'll just see all these little rolled up roly polies everywhere. Uh, when you put down insecticides. So they're another one of those pretty easy ones to kill, but you, but and those are the ones you can get away with that light end of the, the label, that third of an ounce per gallon. They're not, not beneficial the, for anything. Uh, uh, to be um, honest with you, I don't know a lot about them. Um, I haven't really, they're not really a pest, so I don't really see them much, um, other than an annoyance like silverfish or some of those other ones that you see in your house, more of a nuisance. Yeah. Any other questions today? Well, again, guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to come out. And if uh, you do have uh, any other questions or topics that you'd like us to cover, um, I think next time we'll probably...